the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't know if you saw it or if you remember it, but last Monday the Fresno Bee had a headline that said, High Speed Rail Still Alive, But Future Deeply Uncertain. I would guess that as we stop and think about it, I think there's an awful lot of uncertainty today, and it's not just about the high-speed rail. In fact, I would guess there's a lot of people that they go to bed on Sunday night with bated breath, wondering what they're going to wait to on Monday morning. Will the stock market skyrocket a thousand points, or will it plummet a thousand points? All sorts of things that we have uncertainty about. Back in the early 70s, we declared a war on drugs. We still have that problem. In fact, it seems to be getting worse with the opioids, etc. It seems that we may have lost that war. After 9-11, we declared a war on terrorism. We seem to be winning that, but it's far from being over. We have uncertainties in terms of where our country is headed. Is it headed towards socialism or nationalism? And which would be the best to head towards? And then I would guess we also have all sorts of personal uncertainties with family members, with spouses. We have uncertainties regarding retirement, or we have uncertainties in our retirement. As I stopped and I thought about that, I was reminded of a, what has become kind of one of my favorite hymns during the Advent season. The hymn is, Each Winter as the Year Grows Older. The first verse says, as each, win each winter as the year grows older, we each grow older too. The chill sets in a little colder. The verities we knew seem shaken and untrue. The verities, the truths we knew seem shaken and untrue. I don't know about you, but I certainly am feeling a little bit uncertain about where everything is headed. The question then is, is where should we look for certainty in uncertain times? I'd like to share a story that gives some insight in where it is that we need to be looking. It's the story of a teenager, a 17-year-old, who grew up in a large family. Like many kids today, it was a large family because of multiple marriages. He was the second youngest in this large family, a not enviable position. It's better to be either the oldest or the youngest, but not the second youngest. But he ended up being his father's favorite, and his father, he didn't hide his favoritism. He actually bestowed expensive gifts on this favorite son which made him and put him in a very bad position with the rest of his siblings. In fact, it got so bad that this young man, he also had a little bit of an ego problem. He had visions of himself, visions of grandeur, in which he shared those visions, telling how his visions, his brothers, and his parents worshipped him. The siblings planned to kill him because they couldn't take it any longer, and they ended up doing even worse. They decided to profit from his disappearance. They sold the 17-year-old to the underground human trafficking slave market. They seized an opportunity not only to get rid of this brother that they hated, but to make a few bucks in the process. This teenager ended up in a foreign country, not knowing the language, not knowing the customs, afraid and alone. Talk about uncertainties. He didn't know what was coming next. Was it going to be a meal, or was it going to be a beating? Eventually, he was sold to a high-ranking official of this foreign country and made a household slave for servant. He tried to make the best of the situation and served dutifully and worked tirelessly uh, for his owner, master. In fact, he did so well at it that he became trusted and was entrusted with the affairs of the owner, at least entrusted with them, till the owner's wife wanted to have an affair with him. He politely refused her, but she persisted, and when she was ultimately rejected, she claimed that he tried to rape her. 
Her story inflamed her slave owner her husband's anger, understandably. He felt that he was betrayed by this person that he had learned to love and this person that he had trusted. He had the young man then thrown into jail. There a bodyguard of the head of the regime and his personal chef were thrown into jail with them, him also for minor offenses. He wondered then what would happen to him if he was convicted of trying to rape the high official's wife. When these two had done very little, he was charged with a serious crime. What would his fate be? There in prison, he pondered a most uncertain future. This is the story of Joseph in our Old Testament lesson. Joseph was alone in a foreign nation. He had experienced the hatred of his brothers. He didn't know whether his father was still alive. He didn't know all sorts of things. He missed his homeland. He missed his freedom. He missed his comforts. He certainly had a most uncertain future. How was all this going to play out? Well, as you probably remember the story, he was summoned from prison by the Pharaoh because the cupbearer finally remembered his uh, cellmate, Joseph, back when he was in jail. And he remembered that Joseph had interpreted his dream and said, your dream means that you're going to be regaining your position. And he had interpreted the dream of the baker that your dream means that you are going to be executed. Both came true. Now the cupbearer remembers because the Pharaoh had had two dreams that nobody could interpret and that were extremely disconcerting to the Pharaoh. The two dreams were of seven skinny cows devouring seven fat cows. Seven emaciated corns of ear devouring seven full corns, ears of corn. Joseph told the Pharaoh what this dream was about. He said this is a premonition that there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. That interpretation struck Pharaoh as being a correct one. And since nobody else knew what the dreams were about, he put Joseph in charge of the country's commerce and of their crops. Joseph has the surplus of those seven years of plenty stored up. And as a result, Egypt would not only be able to survive the famine, but they would also make a profit by selling the surplus to others who needed to eat. Some of those who needed to eat were Joseph's family back in Israel. Jacob sends his brothers from Israel to Egypt to buy some of that surplus food. After a little testing to see if his brothers have changed any, Joseph finally reveals himself, who is now nine years older, to his brothers. And that's where our Old Testament lesson picks up this morning. Now I'd like for us to think about the words that we find there. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the, hap for the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Everything else may be uncertain, but God isn't as far as Joseph is concerned. He now is more mature. His experience now he sees the hand of God in his world and in his life. But stop and think about the uncertainty that Joseph must have been experiencing. Knowing that his brothers wanted to kill him, then putting him in a well to die, he was sold to Ishmaelite slave traders, put on the market in Egypt. Who was going to buy him? What would that person be like? Things were good for a while, till Potiphar's wife ends up taking a liking to him and ends up then accusing him of raping her. The cook lost his head for a little offense. What was going to happen to me? Joseph must have been wondering. Was he going to die of old age in that prison? 
or would he someday be executed? It wasn't until nine years later, when he becomes the Pharaoh's right-hand man, that he now sees the good in all that happened. How God spared his life from his brothers, granted success with Pharaoh, so not only would his life be spared from famine, but also his father and his entire family, along with the Egyptians and along with many other foreigners from surrounding nations. There's a couple things that we need to learn about this. The first thing I would point out, though, and one that you need to understand and understand very clearly is that God didn't make bad things happen. But he can and does use even bad things for his good purposes. You need to understand that God isn't like some of our politicians who give us pain so that they can reassure us that they feel our pain. That's not the case. It's not God doing bad, but rather it was people making bad choices. People making wrong choices. People making hurtful and harmful choices for themselves and for those around them. Just God didn't make Joseph immature and arrogant. Joseph was just a young man who was exercising his free will. God didn't make Jacob a poor father. It's just that Jacob had his favorite and he openly displayed his favoritism. God didn't make his brothers, Joseph's brothers, hate him. They let their own sibling rivalry turn to that hatred. God didn't make Potiphar's wife give her adulterous feelings free reign. She chose to pursue Joseph in an adulterous affair. But God takes all these bad choices sinful choices, and he can even use them to bring about that which he wants. And that which he wanted was to bless and to spare his chosen people. God only knows what the present uncertainties will bring, but we will see his certainties. Joseph learned in the midst of uncertainty. He learned that there is certainty, and that is the goodness, the love, and the power of God. Now, we're never comfortable with not knowing what's going to happen next. We're not comfortable with uncertainty. And that's why so many people are anxious today. Others are angry, and some are despairing, and some have become desperate because of all the uncertainty. But you and I shouldn't be joining them. We need to see the hand of Satan. Satan likes to use on the uncertainties of this day and age to have people lose faith, not only in themselves, but in God. Satan is most assuredly active, but when he is, you also need to know that God is even more active. That God is going to bring about new creations and new possibilities. So while I'm not terribly comfortable with uncertainties in the world or in my life, and while I know that uncertainties can be used and will be used for inappropriate behavior by others, I can't help but be a little bit excited. God's hand is at work, and when all is said and done, we, like Joseph, <coughs> will be in awe and praise of what wonders God can wrought from the uncertainties of this time. God's love is the certainty in uncertain times. Now, you might want to say, well, yeah, but Pastor, that's kind of an exception, Joseph's situation. Is it really? How often does it happen that God uses bad circumstances to bring about the good that he wants? Well, in my four decades plus of parish ministry, I've seen numerous times where it's happened. I don't know how many times I ever had somebody come to me and was concerned and distraught. They had lost their job. The company moved out of town or went out of business completely. How am I going to support my family? How am I going to get a new job in this job market? How am I going to get a job at my age? And over and over again, a couple months later when we were talking, they were telling me how great their new job was how they loved their new responsibilities, how they liked their co-workers, their boss, and you know what they expressed? 
They wished they had changed years ago. I've also known a number of circumstances where somebody had an accident or an injury. Not a good situation. But they go to the hospital, they go to the doctor, they run tests to take care of that injury, and they end up finding an illness or a disease that if it hadn't been caught, would have been potentially untreatable. Happened just recently, a lady, sweet lady comes to our cultural church service. She's always there for a Christmas concert, and she missed it. And a couple months after she had missed that concert, she finally returned to our cowboy service, and I said, where were you? And she explained that before Christmas, she was on a step stool, fell, and cracked her ribs. Her son made her go to the hospital. There, they found a tumor. But it was small, it was encased, they removed it, and she didn't even need radiation or chemotherapy. What seemed like a bad thing, an accident, an injury, ended up being a good thing, saving her from this disease. I've seen over and over again where someone finds the home of their dreams, they put in an offer, somebody was there before them, or they put in a larger offer and they lose that home. But then afterwards, they end up getting a better home at a better price. Over and over again, God takes those dark moments in people's lives and works his miracles, makes that silver lining become very, very uh, evident to them. Those are some of the stories where God makes the silver lining appear. Joseph's story is one, but the best was the first Good Friday. It was the darkest of times, and yet in the darkest of times, there's the most wonderful silver lining, the redemption of all mankind. That was the worst and darkest day in the history of man's sinfulness when you think about it. God sent his son Jesus as the savior of the world, but the savior was betrayed, beaten, and killed by the very people he came to save. Like Jacob, Joseph, and his 11 brothers, God didn't make any of the participants do what they did. They weren't puppets <coughs> on the strings. Judas didn't have to betray Jesus. He chose to. His disciples didn't need to forsake him. They were fearful, and they did. Pilate didn't have to wash his hands. He could have released Jesus. The Pharisees, the scribes, and the elders didn't have to declare Jesus to be a blasphemer. They could have looked and seen that what he was saying, what he was doing, was representative of one sent from God. The crowds didn't have to shout, crucify him, crucify him. They could have shouted, release him, release him. All bad, sinful, terrible choices and actions in the darkest moment in the history of man. Yet God worked the miracle of the silver lining. A silver lining that in those three hours of clouds of utter darkness, what broke forth on Easter morning was the new creation, the resurrection. Christ died on that cross and paid the debt of our sins. God worked his plan and miracle, even in the midst of the most sinful of behavior. That, I think, is what we ultimately need to understand that we need to realize that in the midst of uncertainty, God is still active, and that we can be reassured of the certainty of his love and his intent to bring about the best for you and me. We need to understand that. We need to believe that. When things happen that we are uncertain about, we need to stop and remember the certainty of God's love. We need to say, God, I tried and tried my best, but I'm between the rock and the hard place. I need you more than ever. When at a loss, all is not lost. That's when you, God, do your best work. Please let me see your hand. That's when we need to sit back and relax and start looking for God's soul divine. That's when we need to wait to see the miracle that he will accomplish that is greater than anything that we could have imagined. That was the lesson that Joseph learned, and it's the message of that first Good Friday. Wait and see what God can do. 
even in the midst of uncertainties or with the uncertainties. Uncertainty in our world today, you better believe it. Uncertainty with the craziness of the nations, uncertainty with the craziness of our nation, uncertainty in our lives. But God is here too, in your life and in our world. And you can be certain of his love and his blessings. So, when you have those uncertainties, start looking for God's silver light. May God grant us the power of the Holy Spirit to trust in the certainty of God's love.